Hi everybody and welcome to the webinar I'm about to do. I'm really happy you decided to take advantage of what I've put together for you here. Uh, maximizing read alouds to build language comprehension. So if you're a teacher or a librarian that regularly does read alouds um, for um, groups of children, I'm certain you're going to find some benefit to what we have put together for you in this presentation. If you're not doing re read alouds regularly, I hope that what you hear in this presentation encourages you to start incorporating them into your daily instruction. So the beauty of read alouds and the content of this presentation, uh, it's free. You can do this for free. You don't need to buy a kit or, or put in a purchase order or buy anything. Uh, you can use your own collection of children's books or get them at your library. You might need some post-it notes. You don't need anything expensive. And you just need to practice it maybe two or three times. Uh, no worries, it's so easy. And uh, I think you're going to consider it a win-win-win. So who am I? Who am I? I should probably tell you my name is Dr. Maria Murray. I'm the president and CEO of the Reading League. And what I'm doing here with you right now is my favorite part of my job. I just love to um, take cool stuff that's out there and boil it down and provide it to you and uh, so it helps you do better things with your students, better outcomes. Okay, there we go. I always love to start, if I can, a presentation by offering people a couple of sources you can go back to afterwards if you want to learn more. I like, I'm giving them to you in advance though. So um, Beckin, McEwen, and Kukin's phenomenal book, Bringing Words to Life, Robust Vocabulary Instruction. This is the second edition, extremely popular and for good reason. Uh, and the other is um, a source that Beckin McEwen wrote back in 2001, and it's, it's still good today. Text Talk, Capturing the Benefits of Read Aloud Experiences for Young Children. I got a lot of what's in this presentation from this article. If you'd like to get it, it's I Google that and I get it. <laughs> so you can print it and read it afterward. It'll maybe a 20 minute read and it might solidify what you've just heard me do. I have to, it's, it's like a thing with me uh, and a lot of us here at the Reading League, position what we're about to do somewhere on the Scarborough reading rope. So our focus today is language comprehension. This uh, part, and I might be walking off screen, I'm sorry, but the, the part in blue um, that talks about language comprehension. I'm sure you've seen this, the Scarborough's rope uh, that Hollis Scarborough designed to illustrate how there are two main components that together interact and account for what is needed to become a skilled reader. What's a skilled reader? Someone who can read fluently, effortlessly, and comprehend what, whatever text they're reading. Hollis Scarborough did not invite, invent excuse me, this rope to represent what she imagined or theorized skilled re reading comprehension would need. No, she based it on the scientific research. She included the elements that had been shown to predict reading comprehension. And uh, those are the, the little strands. She excluded and didn't put in the, in the image here those that did not seem to have predictive power for later reading comprehension, fluent, excellent skilled reading. The main components are language comprehension in blue and word comprehension in purple. We're going to focus on the blue aspects, particularly how doing read-alouds can build background knowledge, vocabulary, and oral language. I'm going to pause for just a second or two to let you read this quote from a very small, quick, quick read um, by Matthew Davis, Reading Instruction, The Two Keys. The entire book is based on what we just saw on the Scarborough Rope. We need to be able to accurately and automatically recognize words via decoding. 
phonological awareness, and instant sight recognition of words. Instant recognition of words by sight. And we need language comprehension. We can define that as the ability to understand text if it is read to us. So here, uh, Davis, Davis points out how necessary both of these components are with really strong wording that, yes, we can teach phonics beautifully and ensure that children do get each word off the page just fine, but they're still not going to comprehend if they don't have those oral language components, if they have difficulty with vocabulary, and if they lack knowledge about a wide variety of key subjects. Simple agenda. A few slides, maybe two to five slides on each of these components. I can't go into a lot of depth on them because that's not the point of this, but I just kind of want to warm us up on the, the critical nature of each. And then I want to point out a few things um, and pull it all together on why you're here, how to use a read aloud to enhance each of these. All right, so oral language, we begin with a couple slides on that. The more effort we expend attending to oral language development in children, the greater the payoff will be in their reading comprehension and written composition quality. Makes sense, we just saw it on the rope. Language is so critical for later reading comprehension and writing. So it stands to reason that the more we can develop this oral language piece, the more um, enhanced our desired outcomes and the others will be. So I hope that this slide's message will set the foundation for you for the rest of the presentation and really emphasize one thing. It's real, a lot of this has to do with us. We have to um, get involved in this development of oral language and not just take it for what each child comes to school with. Some things we can't depend on are published tools and programs we are given to do this um, with. Yeah, they have to be evidence aligned and strong and rich and really good quality and al you know, aligned with the science, but we need to commit to filling all of our own oral language throughout the day with a really rich, rich uh, diet of vocabulary and um, we shouldn't baby talk to our students. We need to use sophisticated words like, hey, there's a commotion out in the hall with those third graders. What's going on? Instead of saying, hey, those third graders are noisy. What's going on? Commotion. We want to do that. And, and we need to speak in complete sentences. Hard to do. But once you get in the habit, it just happens. And, and we need to, repeat after me, we need to expect our students to c communicate in complete sentences. It'll be hard to write a complete sentence if you can't speak a complete sentence. Try to notice how students really don't do that or they have a hard time, especially when they're younger. So now let's move into vocabulary. Really, really, really hard for me to develop this presentation without jamming another 20 slides in here about it. Um, vocabulary is a prominent predictor of reading comprehension, highly connected to language and background knowledge. Okay, a little bit of an aside, I gotta get off track a second here and point out something. Many people, if you were to ask them, would tell you that the National Reading Panel Report had a chapter on vocabulary and one on reading comprehension. Not so, check it out. They were not separate chapters. They belonged in one chapter uh, because of their high correlation. The report has a quote I have here. Reading comprehension is a cognitive process that integrates complex skills, oh yeah, and cannot be understood without examining the critical role of vocabulary learning and its instruction and its development. So they knew when they developed that panel, they knew that they had to go in the same chapter. Oral language experiences are the primary means for accumulating vocabulary. Again, that's the point I need you to come across away with for this is that it's up to us and it's up to us to start early. Speaking of early, by age two, children have about two to 300 words in their productive vocabulary many hundreds more are understood as part of their receptive vocabulary and once they enter school they come in with a um, they come in and have to learn about 3000 to 5000 words per year no pressure 
and that depends on the age of the child and uh, numerous other factors I can't get into here but they have to learn many many a day it's so incredibly important that our instruction do all that it can to close the ga vocabulary gaps <laughs> they're uh, jaw-dropping how big those gaps are uh, they exist and they persist if we don't do something about it and um, they exist and persist as kids enter and, and as they exit school so um, it is up to us the next slide all it is is what's on here what makes vocabulary valuable and important is not the words themselves so much as the understandings they afford that's why I chose this kind of brainy network image yes there's a word in there but that word being there allows it allows that bridging to other knowledge and ideas and and other words the reason we need to know the meanings of words is that they point to the knowledge from which we are to construct and interpret and reflect upon the meaning of text okay so I think we know and understand the simple concept the critical concept that comprehension really is um, dependent on words of course all right um, we now have a map uh, thanks to Nagy 2009 levels of knowing a word we want to ensure that we get we make sure that vocabulary is robust enough um, to take our instruction is robust enough to take all the words from that yellow part to the final blue part at the end of the arrow it's not good enough if students have heard of a word but really don't know what it means no that's a small low level of vocabulary knowledge it's not even good enough if they know it ideally for reading comprehension and written composition is that words are known so well that they can understand it and use it in their language and in their written pieces okay so incidental learning just happened to pick it up somewhere not explicit instruction that is the where the majority of our vocabularies have come from pretty cool right it would be neat to know where the moment we learned all of the words um, we know came from uh, but so uh, exposure from hearing them over and over maybe our parents t saying them teachers television from listening to conversations and taking part in those conversations or a language from reading lots and lots um, we'll talk about that but think back to the Scarborough rope for a second to the blue sections of word recognition kind of see how important it is to make sure kids can decode right because if they're reading if they can decode they'll read more and they'll learn more vocabulary this none of this is in isolation it's so com complexly intertwined the more you read those words the more you'll learn those words uh, music television so many sources according to Nagy and Anderson's word counting research this is cool 88,500 distinct words are in printed school English this means even the most systematic direct vocabulary can't teach all the words children up end up learning we can't teach 88,000 words um, and it can't even take care of what they call a modest proportion of words they're going to encounter in school reading materials we have little control over how much children read independently I wish we could control that more and if they are read to at home we can't control that we want to we can't control what they watch on television or on the internet and what conversations they hear or partake and we, we can't control those things but what we can and must control is how much we infuse rich learning experiences in during the school day or during a library session we have to build excitement and curiosity about words uh, again never use child baby talk during our dialogue full sentences be intentional and fill your room or library area with rich unique words on posters hang them from the ceilings if you must hang them out of your mouth everywhere everywhere all right background knowledge let's have some a little bit of fun here uh, we'll jump right in and warm our heads up on background knowledge and then get to the read alouds I want to take a second to differentiate the some people say what's the difference between background knowledge and general knowledge well we need both 
And um, it's exciting that many publishers of curricula these days are making sure to provide um, rich exposure to that wide array of topics to build overall general knowledge. It's a really, really good thing. And um, this wide base of knowledge can come from that. Um, and also it gives us, I guess, a familiarity about a wide range of subjects that we can you know, have as a foundation and then build upon. So it, where does it come from? It comes from years of exposure to the things here. And we have, again, little control how much, over how much kids read at home, what they read, what they watch, what they, what they hear. Uh, the bottom line here, that's what we can control. We can control the cu curricula we choose, the books and languages, language experiences they have. Um, those things on the bottom line here um, on this slide are important. So the curricula should have engaging multicultural content spanning history, science, visual arts, language arts, math, music, more, more, more. Early grades. Has to, we have to include read-alouds of nursery rhymes, poems, um, fairy tales, fables um, from a variety of rich cultures. All grades, concepts, uh, books with rich concepts, folklore, music, weather, uh, different countries, and so forth. Um, vocabulary with similar domains, and that when we do that, children start to hear repetition of words and concepts, and that solidifies things. Okay. Moving along, all right, background knowledge is critical. So to understand a story or a text about beekeeping, we need background knowledge on vocabulary related to bees, aspects of bee behavior, beehives, etc. In order to understand that text about beekeeping, we don't need overall general knowledge like I have here. We wouldn't need to understand um, ancient civilizations necessarily to understand a story about beekeeping. We might, but not really. Okay, so yeah, that background knowledge and, and base of knowledge comes from years of, okay, hope you got me out of order there. That's okay. But I'm going to give you a little simple example of how knowledge of something, um, I think this is something you can read about more with some of Dan Willingham's uh, work. He's fantastic with this. Um, knowledge of something allows us knowledge and understanding of other things. So knowledge uh, uh, just spreads like crazy. So the more knowledge you have about things it allows you to understand other things and learn more about them. So I have a little uh, drawing here of uh, the Fox and the Grapes, one of Aesop's fables. A lot of people are not familiar with that. And I'll tell you about it in a second. Um, familiar, familiarity with Aesop's fables and folk tales. Great, they're interesting, cute little stories, but they do provide a common source of everyday expressions, uh, allowing people to understand those expressions the rest of their life when they hear them. So in the case of the fox and the grapes, if you know it, the fox is thirsty and he comes upon this grape arbor and there's these juicy ripe grapes hanging high above and he, he's dying for them and he jumps up and he can't reach them and he snaps his teeth and falls back down and he tries again, running jump and there's just, he gives all the effort he can and he's getting more and more angry that he doesn't reach them and finally he has to give up. He's not going to be able to get up to them. And he skulks away and mutters, uh, I don't care, they were probably sour grapes anyway. So um, that keeping that in mind, if you knew this story and you had knowledge about it, you would understand um, when you hear people say, aha, uh -huh, sour grapes at, um, down the road, that there's some nuance of resentment after having been rejected, right? So um, otherwise, you're going to wonder why that saying is there. Why did mom just say sour grapes to me after I didn't make it on the football team? What's that? Is she weird? Why is she talking about grapes? <laughs> so um, authors use these, they infuse their beautiful things that they write with um, expressions like this. Uh, they don't want to use anemic, obvious prose. They want to use sophisticated words, places, references, uh, people, 
events and phrases, um, and we have to know them. So something as simple as a read aloud of a folktale or fable gives us that background knowledge that helps us to have better comprehension when we hear it down the road later. What else about background knowledge or knowledge in general, overall knowledge? It, it makes learning easier, okay? Um, if you have a rich base, you don't have to know every little thing about every little thing, but if you have a rich base of um, factual knowledge, you're going to learn more. It's like the rich get richer here as well. Um, I wrote a chapter once on language comprehension. Anyone who's read that chapter isn't going to know that one of the aspects of it was based on a real life experience of mine. Uh, the backstory is that my husband took some f uh, flying lessons, became a private pilot just to have some, a nice hobby, to fly some sm small planes. He begged me to go up with him in the plane, and I said, never going to happen. I don't want our children to be, you know, not have parents. Uh, he said, okay, I won't pressure you, no problem. But he did start pressuring me and uh, hinting, hey, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go see our daughter who lives many states away in just a few hours? Um, like, well, what if something happens to you and you fall over in the plane? He said, well, they have a pinch hitter course you can take. And that at least helps you know how to contact air traffic control and get the plane down. I don't know, but I agreed to do this. I only did it for three lessons and then I quit. But uh, there I am. Um, I don't know if it was my first or second lesson uh, in a small Cessna, terrified. Uh, the day arrives. Keep one important thing in mind. Why am I telling you this? I have no background in anything technical or mechanical. No knowledge. None. My instructor gets right to business. Read off the items on this pre-flight checklist, please. They, you, you take it out of the door, it's laminated, and I, and I start reading. And I don't know the order, but, I, but here are a few things. Throttle 2000 RPM. Magnetos max drop 175 RPM. I mispronounced the word magnetos. I learned it's magnetos. Uh, press to test annunciator panel. Electric fuel pump off. Fuel, pre fuel pressure check. There were many such things that I had to read, read to him at three different times before takeoff and then after landing. And he did each check. Okay, so after the flight, talking to my husband, it dawned on me, we were talking about this pre-flight pre uh, and post-flight checklist stuff, I couldn't remember one single item. Not one. Yeah, I was nervous, but um, each time this happened, I couldn't remember any of them. Even to make this presentation, I had to go look up a checklist to write these things down for you. I had no background knowledge about fuel systems, um, engines, the electrical components that make it all happen. My brain had nothing to hang uh, those checklist items on. I didn't have the vocabulary of enunciator or magnetos or I, I think I know what a throttle is. So it would be impossible or at best take me a very, very long time to make all of this an easy thing to learn. Okay? Um, and that intimidated me enough uh, to quit. I just didn't feel comfortable flying a plane in the air not knowing how it works. <laughs> so my husband, on the other hand, God, he knows everything about, uh, he can just see engines work in his head and, and electricity is, is like a walk in the park to him. Um, so that, he, I, you can ask him if you ever run into him what's on a pre-flight checklist and he'll ramble it all off probably word for word because it makes sense to him. He can see um, how those things work and it make um, a mechanical airplane and all its system is familiar, their systems are familiar and meaningful to him. So he has greater storage of things he learns about planes and recall because the brain has knowledge to connect it to, literally. Um, okay, so I hope this was a cute story for you about how knowledge makes learning easier. Not having knowledge makes you, leaves you in the dark. And yay, children's books are a treasure trove of knowledge and vocabulary. Uh, so we know, we already said that there are large individual differences 
in children's vocabulary and comprehension abilities. We see it in our classrooms. So, and we already said, we need to engage children in talking, interacting with words, perspectives, focusing on important ideas in texts, and involving children in discussions about those ideas, and to build language comprehension, which is comprehending when someone reads to you, we need to offer a lot of decontextualized language experiences. These are discussions and language experiences that include trying to make sense of ideas that are beyond the here and now, not in my classroom, with my teacher and my friends, out there, a, a, a fox trying to reach grapes. Not happening here and now, but I have to think about it out there, decontextualized. It's not happening in my current context. Read-alouds in the earliest grades, K and 1, are often a typical part of a day. If we can maximize for free how we do these read-alouds, just a little twist of what we do with it, those books can provide benefit to all of the uh, language uh, experience or language comprehension elements we're speaking of in these slides. Later grades, we can, um, you know, we, we probably don't have the time to do um, a daily read aloud, but if we do 20 to 30 of them for each domain that we're covering in a curriculum, maybe just reading a poem or a part of a chapter um, or a small uh, related text from a text set we create, just two short uh, read-alouds every day or two can cover 10 to 15 domains in a school year giving people really good are giving our students really good um, background knowledge and overall knowledge too. On the right, uh, I hope you've seen this before, you see a chart of rare words per thousand and the different oral um, and print the oral ones are more down here. There's the ones that you listen to. And print is up here, articles, newspapers, magazines, books, and so forth. OK. Uh, and the so these are the oral and print sources where rare words might appear. 50% of text is made up of 107 of the most common words. Another 45% of text is made up of the next 5,000 words. The remaining 5% of text features rare words. Someone counted them. They say there's 83,000 of them, but what makes them rare is that they, in, they occur very infrequently in texts and conversations. So look at how many rare words children's books contain. 30.9 um, are rare out of every thousand in children's books. Doesn't seem like a lot. It's lower than adult books, it's lower than magazines and such, and newspapers. But notice that children's books, 30.9 in the middle here, um, has more than primetime television shows and even more than college graduates' conversations with friends. When I'm together with you as a college graduate, we're not going to be using rare words. We're going to be talking about the football game or whatever and the weather and, and family and stuff. So children's books have about the same number of rare words as cartoons and even expert witness testimony. Um, about 30 there too because expert witnesses have to lower, um, they can't use fancy words when they're talking um, um, and want the jury to understand them. So how do we extract quality interactions that lead to growth in all of these areas? Children's books are an answer. And um, boy, do they contain a lot of rich vocabulary and rich ideas. So let's dig into using read-alouds to enhance everything we've talked about. We're finally here. Um, it's very simple. So from birth to about age six or seven, of course, children can't read well enough or write well enough to gain benefit to this language comprehension development. They just, they can't read um, a text such as this by themselves, right? So we have to read it to them. As a teacher or librarian 
or whatever else, <laughs> reading to groups of children, the read alouds are so important. How can we maximize these and the conversations that they generate since they're fundable, fundamental to everything we're talking about here? There's every scientific reason to predict that if we intensively focus on this language development during the classroom reading period in early grades, will raise reading achievement for all students. And I think that includes doing these read-alouds. So we can sharpen how we provide non-written oral activities, our read-alouds, using books that have some conceptually challenging ideas, questioning and discussing them, that's where we're going to go, and having the children elaborate in a way that shows that they are um, able to comprehend the main ideas and the language and all of that that we're reading to them. All right. So text talk is a modified read aloud process. So instead of just reading a book and um, having fun with it that we love to do, it's fun to read to children, we can adapt what we do to maximize it. This uh, text talk method is um, based on previous research by Beck McEwen and Kukin, as well as their other, or as well as their own research actually. So you can read more about it in here. It was designed for use with younger children, but it can be easily adapted for all ages. And there are really only two things that we do to adapt our read aloud process to foster this discussion and um, attention to vocabulary. And one is, one. There's one neat trick I'm going to say for the last that can bolster both of these things. All right. The first thing in a text talk, read aloud, ta-da, is to ask open-ended questions. Simple, right? Open-ended questions during the read aloud are those that cannot be answered with a one or two word response. See how this develops oral language. Uh, we don't want yes or no or red or blue or no or you know a simple one word response. We want a multiple word response. We want to draw out these extended responses that develop language. And it's a bonus if we can get kids to do that because a one word response doesn't really tell us if they're comprehending the idea, if they're really with us in this de decontextualized story experience. So it allows us to monitor much more e better if the students are fully comprehending the story's ideas. So we want the first step out of two, practically, is to ask open-ended questions during the read aloud to get that multiple word response. And that entails asking some questions, initial questions, and if those questions aren't giving us what we want, those open-ended questions will ask some more follow-up questions that are also open-ended. So let's uh, look at what it involves. The initial questions, simple. We prompt children to talk about story ideas. Um, we have an example here. Uh, basically, the book Harry the Dirty Dog, a, an old classic story from my childhood, a little white dog with black spots. He loves to get into all kinds of messes during his walk around his neighborhood during the day and then one day he comes home full of soot from a construction site or something like that and his family uh, does not recognize him. It's silly. They think he's some other animal. So um, a closed question after we read this book would be what did they call Harry? And that is going to give you just one word because the book says that they called him strange. What? Look at that strange dog. What did they call Harry? Strange. Great. I, they answered correctly with a rote response, but do I? Does that tell me that they really understand what's going on here? That nuance of um, uh, just not recognizing their dog and confusing the family. Better, better is to say. Why did the family call Harry a strange dog? So that requires A, multiple words to come out, and B, an explanation. And I get now, if a child says, he was so dirty they didn't know who he was, 
Bingo, now I know they're getting the main idea. They're comprehending the story. Um, I have a little uh, hint for you. If, if it's hard for you to come up with these open-ended questions at first, or, or on the fly rather, um, when you're first doing this, and, and you're finding that it's hard to get kids to do this, I would suggest do a pre-read of the book before you read it. You know, pre-read before you read, of course. <laughs> Put some post-it notes inside the book. Why not? You know, um, think of your question a, a day before, write it in there, and there you go. And then it just happens naturally. All right, so I'm going to have you try it. I'm going to have you form an open-ended initial question using this text. I, I know it's a little blurry, but I'll pause here. Please read the few words and think for a minute. Okay, now I want you to, I know you don't have the whole book in your mind yet, but you get the gist. What initial question could you ask that would elicit a multi-word response? So you know your listeners are getting the important idea. Sadly, I cannot hear your responses because this isn't interactive, but here's one possibility. Someone might have thought of asking, why do you think Lily's acting so nasty now that her brother Julius is here? She was never like that before. Why is she asking so, acting so nasty? So this open-ended question has to f get children to focus on the central idea of the cute story. Hey, kids get jealous, and they don't like losing a focused attention that they used to get from their parents. That was kind of nice. Um, and this is really decontextualized, getting into emotions, like when people are jealous, they're angry inside. And sometimes when you're angry inside, you want to um, kind of make the person feel bad. So a discussion of jealousy, wow, a nice vocabulary word too. And character development while we're at it. But a closed question would be what? It would be something like, do you think she's jealous? And they'd say, yeah, and that's it. Do you really know what's going on? Is she acting nasty? Yes. Is she acting nice? No. So those are closed questions, and they do not get at the decontextualized aspect of language, nor get kids to um, give us a multiple word response. Okay, so say we're trying with this jealousy thing, and it's kind of going and kids are all over the place and this is when we would need to give some effort in developing some follow-up questions. They're having a hard time providing that elaborate response about why Lily is acting nasty and um, it's common for kids at first. So we have to lis listen to their initial responses which might be thin, close, but not really there and or they might be distracted by something really interesting in the story and not even be close <laughs> they might be looking at something in the pictures or whatever so you have to push for some more with some follow-up questions how well you can repeat and rephrase what they said all right well you said she's not acting nice why is that what's that all about um, you can incorporate their responses into new questions. Okay, well, she stomped out of the room and she's angry. Let's, let's, what does that mean? Why is she being like that? All right, and if so, if you can always go back and say, all right, I'm going to reread this part of the story. Everybody, I want you to listen and pay attention to what's really going on. This was you being deliberate to encourage them to use the language, the words, of the story to get to the right answer. Listen closely, I'm gonna read it again. Okay, I'm getting to the fun part and the, well, it's all fun, but. All right, so part one of text talk, doesn't cost you a dime, ask some initial questions, and if necessary, follow up questions that are open-ended, easy. Okay, the second part, is to choose two to four sophisticated words to teach 
after the story has been read. Uh, sophisticated words are those, a lot of people call them tier two words. I hate using the phrase tier two because people think of tier two intervention. <laughs> um, Beck and McEwen and Kukin and said to think of them as words that are, I love this, unlikely to be familiar to young children, but reflect a concept they can identify with and use in normal conversation. Ooh, that's good. Boom, it's at the bottom there. So before you do your read aloud, Again, go through the story and choose two to four of them to teach after you've read the story. So, um, again, um, when you choose them, though, after it's been read, we're going to discuss the, have them discuss the vocabulary within the context of the story. So we can discuss jealousy um, after the story and how Lily was jealous. We can provide examples within other contexts. Um, what it means to be jealous other times. And then we can ask students to use words, use the word jealous in their own personal context. All right. My favorite story of all time, Sylvester and the Magic Pebble. Um, on this page alone, there are at least five um, I was going to have you pause and locate this, the story, the words, but I'm, I want to get moving a little faster here. Um, extraordinary, flaming, remarkable, shiver, and excitement. So they say that there are rare and rich words in children's books. No kidding. Look at these. That's one page. So um, if we want to choose the word shiver, for example, we can say, Within the context of the story first, Sylvester began to shiver, probably from excitement, and the, and the rain felt cold on his back. And then we want to explain the word uh, uh, shiver to them. So to shiver means, ooh, to shake a little bit. We're cold or nervous or excited. It's, it's when we shiver and shake, a, we, we can't help it. They ask the children to repeat the word so they get a phonological representation. Say the word, <clears throat> excuse me, say the word with me. Shiver. Good. And um, research is showing here, I have it um, down here if you ever want to go to it, um, that children learn vocabulary better if they see the spellings of the words too. So maybe it would be helpful to write the word shiver on the board and depending on the level of the students, right? I mean, first day of kindergarten, they're not going to have the knowledge, but you could sound it out if they're old enough to understand. Shh. E -v -er. And then, <clears throat> going back to what text talk has you do, it's okay, so let's review. You put it in the context of the story, have, and, and then put it in a different context. Sometimes I shiver when I watch a scary movie because I'm scared and nervous. And, and then when I was little, I used to shiver if I had to sing in front of people or if I was opening a present, so excited or nervous. Um, children, think about what makes you shiver. Start your sentence with a friend and say, I shiver when, and then the children start to use the word shiver. Um, and then tell me. So, oh, okay, I heard Gerald say she shivers when she builds a snowman. I do too, Gerald. Silas, tell everyone what she means when she says she's going to shiver when she builds that snowman. What's happening to her? What would happen to her? Yes, she would shake. So two to four words per story. Just having, um, explaining it in the context, why Sylvester shivered, what it means to shiver in another context, and children putting it in a personal context. So we're, I'm bringing this back. Notice that those steps that we just demonstrated in teaching the word shiver stretch the children f all the way to the end of the arrow. Never heard of the word shiver. Um, now my teacher told me what it means, so I know it, and then my teacher had me know it and use it with my friends. Okay, we had them spell it, see it spelled, we had them make a personal connection, we had them use it, we had them evaluate how their friends used it. That word is now hopefully in them, but um, practice makes permanent, so we got to maintain um, and use that word throughout the day. Ooh, who's going to have um, 
peanut butter and jelly Ritz crackers today. I'm jealous of you. <laughs> um, so we want to anchor them into their mental lexicons and we can do some neat things that are in this uh, Bringing Words to Life book, Robust Instruction. Oops, let's see, I keep using the wrong two things here. So how do we get deep knowledge and use going? Maintenance is necessary. Uh, on the left is a chart that uh, Beck and McEwen suggest during text talk. Every time you hear the children say the word or include it in what they write, you can get all excited ah, and run over and put a tally mark um, on next to it. Um, Maria said, shiver, go write it, give me a tally mark, awesome. Use jealous, yay. So the author said that for fourth graders, they actually created some pamphlets to share with other educators in the building to let them know what, what they were trying to do, sent them to families, and they said, hey students, if you hear a word on TV, radio, conversation, in the playground, or at home, um, you're gonna earn a point. And you need to tell me where the word was, you're gonna write it down, and then you have to explain to me how it was used. You gotta explain the context. It's fine if they, you know, if the word, um, I don't even have, if they use shiver, remarkable, and excitement in one sentence and they even fib a little, I'm fine with that because they're using the words. That's the goal. You can assign words. You can say, hey, go find the words this week, reasonable, inexpensive, or competitive in some ads in the paper or magazines. So the point is to increase, I don't know if I'm doing it justice, but make kids word hungry, increase their interest, awareness, and excitement. This is what we mean by robust infusion of um, vocabulary in the environment. 3,000 to 5,000 words a year. This is how we're going to get it done. Okay, so text talk. I could kind of quit there and say, um, use some open-ended questions, initial ones, follow-up ones, and then after the story is done, teach two to four vocabulary words. But there's something else really, really, really so, so, so important that most people never do. And text talk authors pointed it out, and it's brilliant. Okay? Wait to show the pictures. Wait to show the illustrations. Children will often... And who can blame them? I mean, look how gorgeous illustrations are, colorful, and what's going on there, and why she got an umbrella, and, and where are they, and that looks like my church, and, and this guy's tattoos are pretty cool. I'm sorry, teacher, I love you, but I'm not listening to the word lurched and hummed and um, curb. I'm not listening to that. There's some cool stuff here. So, of course, children are going to ignore the linguistic content. And they're going to, just like when they decode, rely on pictures to answer the questions. Maybe I'll get a quest an answer back to my open-ended question about tattoos, and that's not even what I was talking about. So, please wait to show pictures until after reading. I have this in bold and italics in my notes here. Wait to show the pictures until after reading and discussing a portion, a chunk of the story. So here I am. I'll use this one. It's got some pretty exciting pictures. Um, here I am reading um, a portion. They were vain and jealous. They could spend hours adoring their own ugliness and resented, right, I'm sorry, and resented any who seemed uglier. Vain, there's the word jealous again, adoring and resented. One sentence four huge awesome words. So I'm going to read that page or chunk. I'm going to discuss what's happening. So what does it mean that they were adoring, you know, I'll ask my open question and they have to answer that question of mine by the words that just came out of my mouth, not by looking at this because I'm not letting them see it. That's what we always do. I took some pictures uh, um, from the interweb of teachers and librarians reading with the book showing. All those kids are totally intently looking at those pictures, but they may not be listening to the story. Can you see, I hope, what a critical aspect of a read aloud this little facet uh, is? 
Um, so again, discuss what's happening. So the only tool kids have hanging in the air is those words I just read. Make sure they're constructing ideas and comprehending from my language, not the pictures. Then show them the pictures. So there they are. Look at them so vain and jealous. And then you show it to them. This, this moment of seeing the picture cements what we just read to them, okay? You may have to remind children to listen to the words um, because some kids are going to just sit there and, and wait for the picture to come. Mm -mm -mm. And lest you think that they're going to freak out if you don't let them see the pictures while you're reading, I promise you they love it. Um, it's like it becomes like a game to see if the picture is going to match what they were envisioning in their head. What th this is comprehension literally happening. They're l l comprehending what's being read to them, and then being rewarded with with the reinforcement of the picture. All right, we're kind of at the end. So this is where we started, and this where this is where I'm going to end with Scarborough's rope. Language comprehension is one of two elements or keys needed to unlock skilled reading, fluent execution and text comprehension. So language comprehension is I'm reading it to you or I'm discussing things with you and you get it. Then when you add that or interact with the words on a page, then it ends up happening all by yourself when you read by yourself a text. But um, before you can read words, a lot of them, I'm going to give it to you um, through reading it to you. So I hope that you found this webinar useful for your instruction, initial questions, maybe some follow-up questions. Um, make sure they're providing a multi-word response about what's the, so that they comprehend the things happening in the story, the main idea. And it's teaching two to four rich vocabulary words and waiting to show the pictures. So easy peasy, you've got this. Thank you for joining me today and for your support of the Reading League. It means the world. Don't forget, if you aren't a member, you must be if you're, you're looking at this webinar, but encourage people to join us at thereadingleague.org. I should probably have the right slide up, huh? Have people join us and um, we want everyone to learn. If you're really into learning about the science of reading, um, maybe upgrade if you aren't already to become a subscribing member that gets you um, in the mail the Reading League Journal. This one just came out yesterday, our second issue. And thank you so much. Oh, it's got the new logo on it. There's our old logo. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much. Your support in, in subscribing helps us to sustain all that we do. And uh, we really appreciate you and your commitment to learning for the benefit of children. Thank you so much. We're all done here. Bye-bye.